A break in a brazen crime spree tonight on the News 4 Rundown. How police were able to track down a man accused of robbing multiple 7-Elevens. Plus, I'm Julie Carey and Lorton looking at the incredible damage at this house. It's amazing to know that the family that escaped this fire, they're only talking today about how grateful they were. I'll tell you about how a neighbor alerted them even before the smoke detectors went off and about how this neighborhood is surrounding them with support. And the cherry blossoms at the Tidal Basin are a labor of love. We've got to look at some of the work behind the scenes to help the blossoms bloom year after year. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. We're ready for the blossoms, mm -hmm. are we? Boy, Bring on the blossoms. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everybody, for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Jimmy Adler. And I'm Tommy McFly. It is Thursday, March 14th. Happy Pi Day to all who celebrate. <laughs> Let's begin with the start of some of the top stories we're following for you. Fire at a quarry in Montgomery County was burning for hours, and it's finally extinguished. You're seeing foam being sprayed on that fire on Piney Meeting House Road in Rockville. The fire began around noon after several oil tankers went up in flames and then continued to burn. Thankfully, no one was injured. No reports of that, but people were told within a mile radius to limit their outside activity. The teen accused of attempted murder on board a Prince George's County school bus last year pleaded guilty to charges today. Investigators say Caden Holland pulled the trigger of a gun three times as he tried to kill a 14-year-old but that gun malfunctioned each time. Holland faces decades in prison when he's sentenced in May. Team Insider J.P. Finley has confirmed that the Washington Commanders have traded Sam Howell, as well as the fourth and sixth round picks to the Seattle Seahawks. In exchange, they get the third and fifth round pick. Howell started all 17 games for Washington in the last season, and the commanders are expected to draft a new quarterback with that second overall pick in the draft. Former President Donald Trump's hush money trial was set to begin in Manhattan March 25th, but looks like it may be delayed. In a court filing today, District Attorney Alvin Bragg said his office does not oppose a delay of 30 days. Trump's team requested a 90-day delay. The judge will make the final call. And Jim, developing now, a break finally in that brazen crime spree. Prince George's County police say they've arrested a man accused of robbing eight 7-Elevens in the course of just two days. Yes, Stefan Janey from Upper Marlboro is charged with using the jaws of life to break into the ATMs and steal tens of thousands of dollars. Our Amy Cho explains how police tracked him down. The crack in the case came through cell phone records. For several months, police had been trying to catch the people robbing 7-Elevens across Prince George's County. The crimes always followed the same pattern. Control the clerks, use a Jaws of Life tool to break into the ATMs and steal cash, destroy the cameras, and get away in a luxury vehicle. You always risk that uh, all it takes is a trigger pull and you're going to have uh, uh, something worse happen. Last night, Prince George's County Police say they chased and arrested 31-year-old Stefan Janey from Upper Marlboro. The arrest warrant reveals how police pulled cell phone records, which showed the same phone had been at eight of the robberies. The warrant says Janey then became a suspect. When police searched his home, they say they found ski masks, cash, a stolen vehicle, and guns. Police say in total, the suspects allegedly stole tens of thousands of dollars. The community um, that within these regions that have access to these ATMs, um, that's their only means of getting cash. At one of the 7-Elevens that was hit, this empty hole remains where the ATM used to be. Workers tell News 4 the store has been hit three times over the past year and corporate didn't want to replace the ATM after the last time. The employees here at the 7-Eleven didn't want to go on camera, but they told me they were very relieved to hear the news that the suspect had been arrested. They also said they are holding out hope that the other suspects will be caught soon too. Stefan Janey now faces 44 criminal charges. He's currently being held without bond. Amy Cho, News 4. Amy, thank you. And we've seen similar ATM robberies at 7-Elevens in D.C. and Virginia, though it's not clear if those cases are connected or if the suspects are from different groups. Jim? D.C. police are now enhancing patrols in three drug-free zones. It's all part of a new D.C. crime bill 
Signed into law this week, officers will enforce those drug-free zones in Chinatown, the Benning Road Northeast Corridor, and the Garfield Heights neighborhood in Southeast. Now, under that anti-crime bill, police have the power to break up groups of two or more people if they're suspected of buying or selling illegal drugs. And as the legislation indicates, drug-free zones cannot be more than 1,000 feet in each direction of the area. So with that designation, these areas were posted uh, at least 24 hours in advance with the signs that you see. There's an example of an orange sign behind us that outlines the boundaries of the drug-free zone as well as the time frame where they'll be implemented through. In Chinatown this morning, officers could be seen in squad cars, on bikes, and handing out flyers, too. Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner Thomas Lee represents a portion of that area. He said he hopes the drug-free zone enforcement will bring improvements for residents and businesses. Tommy? Imagine if this, for one second, was your home. Much of it gutted by fire. The Lorton family that escaped the flames is focused on the fact that they're still alive and they are giving their neighbors credit for helping them be safe today. Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey takes a look at the terrifying moments that came even before the smoke detectors went off. It looks like it's on the back of their house, like their porch is on fire. Ring camera video showing a frantic neighbor pounding on the door, calling 911. A passerby joining her. You're all decks on fire, I think. Our deck is on fire. I go around, you don't find it. Seconds later, Andrea Smith runs out the door carrying her five year old daughter. Only then does the smoke detector sound. We got out and I immediately, there was a glow from the side of the house. The flames were raging from the side of the house. Husband Rob leaving soon after, going back upstairs to save the family dog, Grizzly. Rob says by the time he escaped, smoke was pouring into the house. Without that early alert from the neighbor, there would have been much more to contend with. It was spine chilling for me to just think about that if we were asleep and there were no neighbors knocking at the door, yeah. that would have been the beginning of our clock. This couple talking not about their tremendous material loss, but instead focusing on their gratitude. That we are well, our daughter's at school. Can't be angry when you put it all in perspective that way. And help from the neighbors only just starting with that knock on the door. Some took off work to get groceries, buy water, and to take care of little Parker. They launched an online fund. This is this is unreal and the love is not stopped. The support is not stopped. Our neighbors like really have have really shown themselves to be of, of a different breed of, yeah. of the kind of character yeah. that I, I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's it's amazing to know that that you're surrounded, that you live around people like that. Yeah, Rob blaming himself for the fire. He believes that this device he used the night before to smoke food on the grill somehow reignited. He says when they rebuild, there will be a smoke detector outside on the deck. And the couple says they will rebuild right here in the neighborhood that embraced them on one of their worst days. We can rebuild. We'll be back. In Lorton, Virginia, I'm Julie Carey, News 4. Love their energy and also those neighbors coming together like that. Now, Andrea Smith says she's also grateful that a family heirloom, a piano, was spared in the fire. It was handed down by her dad, who passed away suddenly last year. Jim? Now to an update in the University of Maryland hazing investigation. We've learned four University of Maryland fraternities are now filing for a temporary restraining order against multiple university administrators, including the university president. Earlier this month, a number of Greek life organizations were ordered to stop chapter activities after allegations of hazing. Now, according to the Fraternity Forward Coalition, the press agency representing four fraternities, the restraining order would prevent the university from imposing restrictions on the organizations. The school sent out a statement that reads, quote, the University of Maryland expects to update its campus community tomorrow on the status of the investigation that was launched to prioritize the well-being of our students. We won't comment further on the recent court filing other than to state that our process is in line with university policies and puts safety at the forefront. The press agency representing some of the organizations claimed some students were asked to turn over their cell phones as part of the investigation. The university denies that claim. We're getting so close to peak bloom in the peduncle elongation. So before 3,700 cherry trees show off their beautiful petals, 
there's a lot of care that goes into this, kind of like a cherry blossom glow up and preserving them for years to come. So News 4's Joseph Olmo was at the Tidal Basin today to learn from the National Park Service who care for these trees. Hello from the Tidal Basin. Can we just say it all together one final time? Peduncle elongation. We got Matthew Morrison with the National Park Service here on News 4. Matthew, please tell me when we can stop saying peduncle elongation. When are we going to see peak bloom? Well, peak bloom might be a little bit earlier than predicted. This is fabulous weather. If it holds up, um, it might be a day or two early. So maybe the 24th, if we get a cold snap that comes through. We'll be back to the 26th. We are used to seeing the beautiful cherry blossoms, of course, in the spring and just for a couple of weeks in the spring. Yeah. But this is a job that requires winter, spring, summer and fall to keep the over 3,700 trees along the Tidal Basin and in D.C. in good care. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, we uh, we've got our in-house tree crew and they're out here around the, the calendar. Uh, taking care of any of the problems that we have with our trees. Pruning, dead wood removal, sometimes entire tree removal, sometimes planting trees, sometimes spreading wood chips to amend the soil. We look for dead limbs, crossing limbs, and problematic portions. Whatever, to keep these yeah. trees as beautiful as they are every year. Okay, I'm going to turn you into News 4 reporter. And you're going to be the arborist. Exactly. All right, I'm going to be the arborist here. Which uh, is a branch that you're looking out for us to cut here? So, yeah, you're looking at it. That's a conflicting limb, and if you go ahead and take those out. Let's try it. Yeah. Like the arborist that you there are, we there go. you go. How about that? Very good. Okay, and why do we cut these ones down specifically? Because I see that they do have some buds on them. They sure do. When they grow in among themselves, they'll sometimes rub and create an infection. And um, so it's a proper pruning procedure to take the crossing limbs out and let the ones that build up the canopy on the outside prosper. Okay, Matthew, it's time for me to switch over. I think I'll let you be the arborist and me be the News 4 reporter. I'm sure it never gets old being out here, though. Never at all. This is a fabulous place to be. Hey, guys, we're only a couple days away from the 2024 Cherry Blossom Festival, but remember, it is a job year-round here at the Tidal Basin. Back to you. Boy, mm. an outdoor job on a day like this. Uh, yeah. They had some fun. Are you sure that one? Are you positive that's the one? That's it one we're cutting? better be sure? the one. <laughs> <laughs> they mean business down there. Still to come on the News 4 Rundown. Why is everything so expensive? It's a question you probably asked yourself a time or maybe 20 times. Maggie Moore from our digital team has been researching this precise question for weeks and joins us with some answers. Plus, early detection is key when it comes to breast cancer. Coming up, we're working for your health with a new risk assessment tool. And changing the game, the Smithsonian exhibit showcasing inventions that have helped athletes throughout history. All right, remember the days you could go to the grocery store for just a few things and leave without a gigantic bill? Well, the days of buying a dozen eggs costing less than $2, are, are they over? Well, yeah. Well, today's hefty grocery bills aren't figments of our imagination. On paper, the economy is doing really well. The stock market is soaring. Wages are creeping up. And unemployment is low. So why is everything so gosh darn expensive? Digital producer Maggie Moore has been researching this for weeks for our NBC Washington platform. So Maggie, why does it feel like we can't afford anything at all? I have just the thing to explain this. Okay. Whoa, what is, what yeah. is that? What this. <laughs> does this have to do with the <laughs> inflation situation? This is the reason that even though wages might have been going up and uh, the economy is doing well, mm -hmm. you might not feel like you can afford anything right now. Take a look. This is your bank account. When you have expenses, you need to spend money on certain things and cover those costs. Food, rent, student loans all come out of your bank account, and that's how you pay for everything you need to live. You replenish that money by earning wages at a certain rate, and then spending at the same amount that you were before. This system all works until the cost of things gets more expensive due to inflation. Then, to cover your expenses, you have to spend money at a faster rate. And then because you're spending faster, even if you're earning more, your bank account really doesn't see a difference. Boy, hmm. that's drained. That's right. That yeah. puts it in perspective, gives us a visual. So the reason for high costs is inflation and wage raises aren't quite keeping up. Why can't prices just go back down, Maggie? 
So inflation is just the word we use for goods and services getting more expensive over time. It kind of just happens when the economy is based on continuous growth, which ours is. Economist Sarah Foster, who's a researcher for Bankrate that I spoke with, mm -hmm. uh, told me that a little bit of inflation is actually a good thing, even though it doesn't quite feel like that right now. Uh, it shows that the economy is doing well. It's continuing to grow. And also, it can help workers negotiate for raises. So if you go to your boss and you ah, say, hey, yes. eggs are more than $2. Uh -huh. This isn't quite working anymore. That, that can be a, a nice thing to have. Uh, prices going back down is called deflation, and that is actually a bad sign because if stuff gets too cheap, people might wait to spend their money. And if too many people wait to spend their money, then yeah. the money essentially gets sad and the economy could crash about that. So the it's money not good. gets sad. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want that direction. No, no. we want happy money. <laughs> yes. So is inflation the only thing impacting how expensive everything is? Inflation is slowing, we hear. So why are people still seem to be struggling? So there's a couple reasons. Uh, one is that we're all experiencing the same economy, but in very different ways. Mm -hmm. So if you take someone who's working a low wage job, they were probably paycheck to paycheck even before inflation surged. And they were putting most of their money towards things that they need, like food, rent. Those are things you can't get around. You can't just not spend that money. Mm -hmm. exactly. So they may have been more likely to see a raise in the last year, but they were also hit harder by inflation. Uh, someone who had an office job even through all of the pandemic, uh, they might not have gotten a raise. They're statistically less likely to have, but they also had a little bit more of a cushion saved. Ah. So both of those people are feeling the impacts of this mm -hmm. inflation. They're just feeling it differently. The other thing, and this is a term that was coined by an economist on TikTok and then reported by the New York Times, is vibe session. So what do you do when things mm -hmm. get hard? You commiserate with other people. A sure. lot of people commiserated with each other on social media. And right. then the more you see that stuff is bad, the more it feels really bad. And then even after things get better by those metrics that economists are measuring and the economy is doing well, the vibes are still pretty atrocious. So that's mm -hmm. part of it, too. You can talk yourself into it. I like that yeah. word. I heard that yesterday, too, vibe session. So the vibes are bad, but the economy's good. And if wages go up, the inflation, one would think, would even things out, but there's more to it than that. Yes. So we all remember those supply chain issues during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Stuff got really expensive to make and sell, and that meant it got expensive for us to buy, too. But the prices stayed high way longer than those supply chain issues have lasted. So that happened in, even in areas where you couldn't wait out the high prices, food, rent again. Uh, I spoke with Ron Hill, who's a marketing professor at American University. He's also worked as a consultant with a lot of corporations over the years. And he said that it's not all down to overhead costs. Sometimes it is greed, especially now that we recognize that after the pandemic, what, what occurred was a lot of organizations found that they couldn't get access to the things they needed in order to bring products to market. So things got particularly expensive during that period. And so some companies haven't rolled back those costs at all. In fact, they've continued to operate that way. Thank you so much. Boy, you laid it all out there for us. Yeah. And it's not easy because everybody's at a different level or yeah. view of things too, as yeah. you say. There's a lot of different pieces for a lot of different people. So I, I hope I can help explain some of it for yeah. someone. Great that stuff, great. Maggie. Thank this you. is not so attractive. It's right. <laughs> yeah. It got our attention, it's, uh, though. It's a little bit Bill Nye Science Project, but I had fun exactly. making it. So. It proves the point. Did. Digital Thanks producer so Maggie much. Moore, a.k.a. TikTok Maggie, we appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. When we come right back on The Rundown, the wait for peak bloom continues. I looked into a few things that you can do outside of the Tidal Basin while you're waiting for those blooms to blossom. It was a big day for the University of the District of Columbia. Maurice D. Eddington was sworn in as UDC's 10th president today. The inauguration took place at the school's Theater of the Arts. It's an incredible honor just to be able to stand up before you <clears throat> and could commemorate and celebrate this next chapter in UDC's history. Congratulations, by the way, President Eddington began his tenure in August of 2023. An early diagnosis is key when it comes to cancer. You can just ask actress Olivia Munn about that. The 43-year-old recently revealed she underwent multiple surgeries, including a double mastectomy after an MRI last year and led to a biopsy. Two months earlier, she had a normal mammogram result. Munn said her diagnosis came after her OBGYN decided to calculate her breast cancer risk assessment score. Our Unyang has more on that potentially life-saving assessment. 
Joining us now is Dr. Lucy Dela Cruz. She is the chief of the breast surgery program at MedStar Georgetown. Thanks for being here. Um, there are a lot of people talking about this risk assessment screening tool that can calculate your breast cancer risk. How does this work? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, this is a very interesting question. And I think thanks to Olivia Munn, who just came out and really openly discussed this. You know, we have patients who are at average risk. So the average woman's risk of having breast cancer, it's not zero. It's actually up to 12%. Uh, then there's the patients who have genetic mutation whose risk is up to 60 to 80 percent. But then there's those patients that fall in the middle that potentially are also at risk and maybe elevated lifetime risk, but they're really nobody's really assessing them. There are certain ways of calculating this. The most, the two most popular ones are the Gale model that looks at women who have a first degree relative with breast cancer. Then there's the Terra Cusick that incorporates not only family history not only the first degree relative, uh, but also other relatives in their family with breast cancer and even ovarian cancer. And one of the things that we don't realize is having multiple breast biopsies also increases your lifetime risk of having breast cancer if you put it into the calculation. So most women don't necessarily have a family history uh, of breast cancer in their family when they're, uh, they're diagnosed with breast cancer. And only five to 10% of women have a genetic mutation that we identify when they're diagnosed with breast cancer. So there is this online version of this tool that anyone can take. How accurate and reliable are the results on this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we use it all the time. It's a validated tool. I think it just has to do with the information that you input. So I always tell patients to be very careful about inputting information there that may not necessarily be accurate because that does impact the results. And that's why I think patients should do it, but they should ultimately double check with a clinician who is very, who is, um, uses this tool all the time. So that way they can fine tune it and make sure that the degree of risk that they get is actually their risk. And so what happens if someone does score high on this risk assessment? So as I mentioned to you, the average uh, risk of having breast cancer is about 12%. Anybody above 20% is considered high risk. And so we put them on a protocol that is specifically tailored to their needs and what their actual risk is, and we follow them in our high-risk clinic. All right. I mean, important to take care of your health and really take charge of it and go see a doctor if you have any um, idea that this might be something that is part of your family history or not, just to be concerned about your breast care. Uh, Dr. Lucy, uh, Dr. Lucy Dela Cruz from MedStar Georgetown, thanks so much for that important information. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. A new exhibit at the National Museum of American History is showcasing inventions that have changed the game for athletes throughout history. It's fittingly called Change Your Game. It focuses on devices that have made sports safer. Some of the innovations on display include the Converse All-Star Basketball Sneaker, Got to have that, mm -hmm. a corked basketball, baseball bat, and, of course, the cutting-edge Hawkeye camera, which is used to call shots in real time at the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. This exhibit is for those who come in here, and when you walk through it from beginning to end, you should come out of the feeling like, it, I can be a game changer. I can do something amazing and invent some things. The exhibit is expected to be on display at the National Museum of American History for the next few years. So you've got time. All right, here we go. Look who's having a mm. mocktail. Yes. Finally tonight, we're counting down the hours until peak bloom. If you can't wait and you want to get into the cherry blossom spirit, there are plenty of ways to celebrate beyond the title base. I've been looking into, into this for you, Jim. How about we start with salted cherry blossoms? Let's do it. Now, don't eat the ones at the uh, title base and do not no, eat those. Don't These do it. mocktail garnishes come from Tenari in downtown D.C. They use it in a salted cherry blossom martini, but okay, we're just going to go ahead and taste you. the garnish. These come in from Japan. They're dehydrated. Wow. Rehydrated. A little salty. Emphasis on savory mm -hmm. salty. But you it add looks in. like it's going to be sweet. Yep. You would add them into okay. like a martini or a mocktail mm -hmm. like this. There's so much going on. Also, there are a bunch of events I want to let you know about, like the Library of Congress Japanese Culture Day coming up on the 23rd. The Japanese Culture Day, it's been 13th year this year. We have so many meanings in it. We have a floating koi, that means a fish. We have a special author coming. Miss Sugiura talks about her book, and she's a Japanese-American, Japanese dance, traditional dance, and a Japanese drum, origami code. We have calligraphy, supported by the Embassy of Japan. 
Near the Tidal Basin in Southwest, Arctic House's celebration of anime brings art and technology together. You can check out Isekai Blooming Parallel Worlds. And look at this. How many bricks do you think it takes to build DC at peak bloom out of Legos? Lego Discovery Center in Springfield has hundreds of cherry blossoms and other local landmarks. On display all throughout spring, it took more than a million and a half bricks to build. And you can pick a picnic. Love on the Run in Capital Crossing is leaning in to Chef Makoto's culture and encouraging Haname. Hanami literally translates to flower viewing. You know, we really wanted to bring the tradition to Washington and share this with um, everybody in the city. And the picnic, the picnic's got sushi, it's got uh, yeah. donuts, also ramune, which is a right. Japanese beverage. So give it a and pop. And I gotta hit it. Yep. Woo! Oh, there you go. Whoa! And have I got a sip. some smoke coming out of this. Mm. Cheers to peak mm. bloom. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I gotta wash this down with some sushi. Go for it. Good I mean, stuff. Somebody get Hanley a napkin. We'll be Thanks back tomorrow. Thanks for dinner, Tommy. Thanks for joining us on the rundown. Mm. <laughs>